Thank you. Maraming salamat, uh, PIDS, for inviting the Solaire to participate in this uh, forum. I will have to say at this point that the amount of work that um, Dr. Connie uh, has done in both papers along with her co-authors, uh, Dr. Lawrence for the first paper and um, Christina, Anne, and John, they are tremendous. And so I... But you know, but but because I am discussing, um, I am drawing from my experience as a researcher, which have done uh, some of studies which are similar, and have dealt with uh, some difficult problems in terms of data constraints. But also as a teacher in a Solaire, where my students are practitioners, no? human resource uh, practitioners. So I will be presenting a different perspective, which you may consider or not. So I will now. It doesn't mean that it is um, opposing or disagreeing with your comments. So I, I presented it in a form of a question just for you to, to consider. So I will now uh, share my PowerPoint. So the wait, oh, let me let me just put it in. Sit here. So the layout. Okay. Come over. Sorry, are you? Yeah. Okay. So. So the first question that I have is. Is discrimi discriminatory gender wage gap exist? Does it exist? Because you know, if, if you have a pay gap between males and females that are due to non discriminatory factors, meaning that they are attributed to differences in productivity, then there is no reason to uh, have a policy that will narrow the gap. People are paid according to their performance. And so that's why we have different salary scales for different according to different ranks. And those ranks are also determined by your performance. And the reason why the discriminatory gender wage gap is very difficult to measure has also a lot to do with the limitations of the PISOC, the Philippine Standard Occupational Classification, because it does not allow the disaggregation at very specific levels of occupation. So for example, the teachers have different, so you have this, what is your occupation, and is your teacher, but you know, a teacher can have different salary grades depending on the rank. Instructor one is uh, paid differently from assistant professor two and professor 10. So there are 
different um, routes. A and these routes, again, are not differentiated between male and female. It's just a court. If you have a PhD, then you move into professor. If you have so many publications, then and so on, you move into step one, step two. And because you also have that, the salary grade, DOLE, this has their own salary scheme, the IDS is one. I think you know that it, it's not something that you differentiate if between male, female. It's really just we, and all the companies who design their salary structure to be free of bias. So it's something that you review regularly so that it will reflect compensation scheme will reflect the performance or productivity of the worker regardless of her or his gender identity. I think the, this one is also saying that even more complicated is the fact that salaries of teachers in the same rank can also differ between private and public schools. So Professor Lawrence is probably paid three times more or four times more than a professor of the same rank in UP. Okay. <clears throat> The other thing also, which is a data constraint, is that the respondent of the labor force survey, usually this one, you know, usually probably the household head spouse, is the one who provides the data on occupation of all the employed members of the household. So it, she cannot be very specific. She cannot say professor one, two, three. Probably it's a teacher, no? Because it, 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 the person, the worker, is not the one asked. It's somebody who was there when the enumerator went to the household. She can provide. And so that it cannot be at that very detailed level. And again, I already said that the... When I ask my students, and they are all HR people, they said there's really no, there's no distinction between the male, the female, or if you look at other gender identities, LGBTQA plus plus. Yeah, I mean there's no, they don't, they don't discriminate. And uh, young gender, medyo, young term na gender pala is also more co complex now than before because you are born a he and when you enter the labor market, the he now becomes a she. So I do not know how that plays out in the survey. If you identify yourself as a woman but born, as a man, but anyway, that's a, the point is that the salary structure of any company or organization is not designed differently between a man and a woman or LGBTQ. It's not according to the, uh, the gender identity. It's really according to your performance. If... Um, they feel that there are biases, then the next year you have a way to review it and then you just change it. But it's really performance piece. So uh, there are also non-discriminatory causes of wage gap. And when this is non-discriminatory, you, you don't do something about it because, for example, market forces can play a role in determining 
or in engendering a gender wage gap. For example, in sports, male star basketball players are paid more than female star basketball players. Why? Because revenues are larger from the higher price and volume of ticket sales for male basketball games. People are willing to pay more and to watch more male basketball players play than they do for women. So that's why in sports, males are paid better. Boxing, maybe. You watch, you are willing to pay high price tickets to watch Manny Pacquiao play, but not willing to watch Nestle Petition play. You, nobody is interested to watch. So things like that. It's, it's driven by market forces and you do not regulate. It's nothing to do or probably less to do with employer discrimination. So the second one, so so again, this one is something that uh, again you can think about is is whether in the first place there is really that gap that is true to employer discrimination. And then now uh, once you have it, then identify how it could be narrowed. But again, to me, you know, it can be can be very difficult because of the data constraints. The second question that I'm asking here is about the job skills. So in the beginning, to, there was a question to the uh, participants on whether you think that the job skills mismatch is uh, very large are very significant. And I will pose the question of whether do whether we really have a job skills crisis or a job crisis. Because there are hard to feel occupations, but there is also a massive unemployment and underemployment amounting to 10 million uh, Filipinos in the labor force. You can see here, and, and the youth unemployment is three times higher than that of adults. 17%, they go to tertiary education, completed it, and they are not able to find the right jobs. 17% for the youth and 5% it's down to 13, but still very high, and 4%. So you, you add up the unemployment, maybe unemployment close to three, 3 million, and then 7 million underemployed. So that's a huge number of Filipinos who are either unemployed or underemployed. If you are going to look at the profile of education, you would see that uh, it, there is increasing education over time. So the very high unemployment rates, but education is already increasing. Um, you, you can see here, for example, that uh, the, wait, sorry, the, the percent of the youth with elementary education is only uh, 6%. And corresponding figure for adults is 23%. But, um, but you know, the elementary occupations comprise more than 30%. The jobs, elementary occupations, which require Elementary education is 30%. 30% of the workforce are 
uh, employed in elementary occupations, which require only elementary education. So, so that so that gives you a bit of an understanding of the well, the mismatch can also be over education, no? You can see here that there is already an increasing growth of education, particularly among the junior and the senior high school, but also quite high for college graduates and above. No? I I'm saying that because we later I will explain that maybe investments to increasing the quality of education may be more significant than increasing education per se. Okay. okay, let me, so as you can see from here, the unemployment rate um, is actually higher. So this is the unemployment rate and it's actually higher for the, the better educated. So it's not as much for the, well, it, it's still high, but it, it much higher still for uh, the better educated, the, which means that you improve education does not always lead to higher employability. This one is really a simple identification of over-education. It, it's not like the very complex uh, exercise done by Dr. Connie and Dr. Lawrence. It's just simply they, the ILO has this, okay, so you have managers which needs at least uh, college educated uh, elementary occupations should, should the matching, matched uh, educational level would be elementary. So if you are, if you are high school and you are working, uh, in elementary occupations, and you're overeducated. And this one will show you that more than 50% of the youth and more than 40% of the adults are overeducated. They have more education than what is required by their occupations. And this overeducation is not something that is temporary or transitory, it, it seems to persist over time and even worsen. And then now I, I would also show that the structure of the enterprises that we have in the Philippines. So you have your micro, small, medium, and large. And the micro, micro enterprises comprise of 89%. The small is 10%. The medium is 0.5%. And the large is 0.5%. And I'm showing this because the demand is coming from the industry. And the hard to fill occupations, which would require higher level skills, are not coming from the 99% of small and micro. These are enterprises that are, many of them are accepted from having to pay the minimum wage because they do not have the capacity to pay even decent wages for their workers, much less to adopt technology and which would require higher level skills of workers. Where do they exist? They exist here in the point in the large companies, which are just 0.5% of the total enterprises. And I think when we We'll talk about um, the, because this one will involve then the targeting. Which ones? 
really uh, have uh, experience or report having deficiency in skills in terms of uh, certain jobs. So you, this can be targeted, the 0.5% large primarily. So you do a skills needs assessment survey. The, these are important across occupations and across sectors or industries. They, these are important, the 0.5% large companies. So the mismatch between the skills supplied by the education system and the industry can be solved. I mean, this is one by, and I think very important, it's done in other countries, by a dual training and apprenticeship or apprenticeship joint industry academy. So they are more or less the same thing. Dual training program, apprenticeship program, joint industry academy programs. The large companies have more assets, they have more resources, and they have a higher rate of adopting emerging technologies. Very difficult. I mean, the technology, emerging technologies to adopt them is very costly. UP could not catch up with the pace of technological advance, advancement, no? But, but then so also are many of our industries, definitely not the 99% of the enterprises, possibly some medium enterprises and mostly the large companies will have that capability to adopt. And one new technological transformation, of course, would have a higher rate of uh, shifts in skill requirements. Some skills become obsolescent and some will have to be created. New ones will have to be created as you adopt new technologies. Having said that, I so so I am saying he, here basically my point here is that sometimes you know you the blame is on the education sector because they the, they supply low skilled workers, but but sometimes it's really but I'm not saying it, it's very difficult for the education sector to catch up with the pace of technological advancement. The industry is usually the, the, the ones who adopt it first. And therefore, the dual training uh, program is very important. Um, so, and this one has to be uh, amended by a law. Uh, it has to be strengthened. No? So where the training is now done by the industry. However, I'm... Even if I do say that, I also believe that the quality of Philippine education needs to be improved. The tertiary graduates in the Philippines have lower skills and competencies than tertiary graduates in Singapore. The Program for International Student Assessment, or the PISA, in 2022 showed that the Philippines ranked third lowest in science and sixth lowest in math and reading. So I believe that the Philippine education has to be improved, but it should start in early schooling. You, you don't just jump into to the college level. So you, you start with early schooling, uh, improve the science, math, uh, reading, in all this. So, and then you build upon that towards tertiary education. So, so the, the investments would be voluminous because then you have to start from earlier schooling. It, you don't just jump into tertiary schooling. You know, you don't, if it's something that requires uh, complex or advanced calculus or statistics to be able to learn better about data science and so on, then you have to go backwards. You start with early schooling. Wait, sorry. 
Yeah, I'm just saying here that the, the nature of work. Now, I'm going now to skill needs, and this is the last one. Skills needs anticipation. If the technology advances at an unprecedented rate, then the nature of work and skills requirement also evolves and shifts at a rapidly accelerated rate. And so it's not static. You know, you there, there, there has to be a mechanism where you review uh, the skills framework uh, regularly, especially for fast moving types of skills. The Future of Jobs 2023 report uh, uh, shows that 40% of the jobs will be disrupted by technological change. And therefore, there is need for constant reskilling and upskilling of the manpower. Again, um, much of this will have to be done by the industry. <clears throat> and here also <clears throat> for the framework, the ILO emphasizes the key role of social dialogue where you have key government agents. I think this one was mentioned by Mom Damo of the Dole. The, the, the social dialogue is crucial across all the phases of uh, the skills needs anticipation, assessment of the framework, forecasting, and then finally coming up with uh, future occupations and education targets. No? The, that, that has to be embedded. They suggested that this one will be embedded in institutional structures and procedures for skills needs assessment. So you will have key government agencies, you have labor market actors, meaning the uh, workers group, the employers group, Philippine Chamber of Commerce, social partners like the academic research institutions. Huh? Um, in Bangladesh, for example, they have, uh, but we also have this now, the Tripartite uh, Skills Council. Uh, Mom Damo already mentioned it uh, earlier. So, but, but Bangladesh also has that. And uh, also in Finland, um, they employ a social, they, they the decision making on, on what types of skills is some is consensual. It, it's a consensus to develop these occupations and then also the education targets. It's not something that's done by, it, 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 it involves, a, again, a tripartite bodies of the occupation. Uh, and then they do it by occupation, by industry, no? Okay. So that, that's just what it is. Yeah. Okay, so that's just what I'm saying, but I think this one was already answered by Mam Damo, the Dole, that there are actually tripartite. I'm just saying that perhaps in the framework, this can be emphasized that along the different phases that there is now uh, embedded on it this process of social dialogue with all of these uh, labor market actors and other stakeholders. No? <clears throat> The other one that I want to say is that the skills um, anticipation framework should be closely aligned and in coherence with the apprentice, apprenticeship system and dual training policies, because then eventually you will have to translate the skills needs into training. And But we, we don't have that yet. The apprenticeship system uh, is very much underdeveloped you know, in the Philippines. We, and in 2022, and this is the one that I said from, from mom of the, the test, though, that only 7% of the total graduates are actually enterprise-based. That is uh, applying the apprenticeship system or dual training system. So, so there could be so only 7%. In Germany, for example, because this is now the modality that, that will correct or narrow the gap, the mismatch between the skills and uh, the needs of the industry. It's the dominant or the primary 
primary modality of learning. But in our Tibet, the Philippine Tibet, only 7% are enterprise-based. And I think there should be studies that will now solve uh, this problem of the lack of participation of the enterprises uh, in Tibet programs. So you have 93% who are not part of the, or not uh, graduates of this modality of joint uh, industry and academic institution program. The adoption of new technologies is costly. And of course, the education system cannot keep up with the accelerated pace of technological change. And that's why the dual training program is really crucial to bridging the skills gap. Again, I'd like to say that in 20, I'm part of this uh, paper by the ADB. So we did it 2020. And by then, at the time, uh, the proportion of graduates from the modality of uh, enterprise-based dual training is 4%. After four years, it increased to 7%. It's too slow to move into it becoming a dominant mode. And I do not think that you can bridge the skills gap if you do not involve the industry in terms of doing the curriculum, in terms of the training, in terms of assessment, and, and even certification. In, the, in Germany, for example, the one who cer certifies is the Chamber of Commerce, Trade and Commerce, Cham Ch Ch Chamber of Commerce. And there is a need to pass bills strengthening the apprenticeship and dual training program. So you have the education and enterprise base training and framework bill. This one is now uh, SB Senate Bill 257. And, and, and I think that we, this one should be pushed. No? Senate and House bills on the new national apprenticeship program. The, these bills have to be pushed so that we can now have a legislative framework on uh, enterprise-based training or apprenticeship program. And, and then we can have the skills needs anticipation framework uh, be consistent with, with this apprenticeship uh, system or framework as well as dual training framework. I think that, that's it. Oh, yeah. Okay. So thank you. I will now uh, stop the sharing. So I think that's everything that I have. Thank you, um, Dr. Emily. 